Welcome to the Chinese Canadian Museums podcast, The School Room. I'm your host, Melissa Lee, CEO of the museum. Thank you for joining us. Today we're exploring the storied history behind the home of the Chinese Canadian Museum, the Wingsang Building. The Wingsang Building is the oldest brick building in Vancouver Chinatown, built in 1889 and designated with heritage status by the Canadian government in 2003. It was built and expanded over time by a man named Yip Sang to house, amongst other businesses, his Trans-Pacific Import-Export Company called the Wing Sang Company. The building also housed Yip Sang's growing family. He had four wives and 23 children. Today, we have the pleasure of being joined by one of Yip Sang's grandsons, Mel Yip, who appeared in Everlasting, our documentary film about the Wing Sang building and its family members on view by our Period Rooms exhibition. So great to see you. Thank you for coming down to Chinatown. It's my pleasure. Maybe you could begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and where you are in the overall Yip family. Okay, I'm number eight uncle. Uh, we lived on the sixth floor. Um, my parents had three sons. I'm the youngest. My oldest were 10 and 13 years. So growing up, I never had much interaction or relationship with them, but I was lucky. I had all the cousins, so I actually had a close relationship with my cousin. Was there a difference between brothers and sisters and cousins, or everybody was kind of like a brother or sister? In my case, because I was so young compared to my brothers, they would hang around, go to school, play, and entertain with older cousins. So I did the same thing. I still have cousins now that they're more like brothers and sisters to me than my own brothers. That's so nice to be part of a big family when you have that kind of familiar relation and you have all these people that you can depend on throughout the years and generations. Why exactly, I feel quite blessed and very lucky to grow up in the Wing Sang building. Not on my immediate family, but I had my grandmother, my aunts and uncle, and all my cousins, so I was never lonely. And also, you know, I'm speaking as a mother now too, free babysitting, right? You have your older siblings or older cousins will babysit the youngers, maybe while the mothers could play mahjong or something. My aunts were my babysitters. My parents married in Hong Kong in 1920 came over and settled, let's say, up to number 10 uncle. They were all married in China. But when they returned, none of the aunts went back to visit their family. Only my mother. I guess for some reason, my mother, when I was in 1935, when I was just a baby, they went back Hong Kong because the youngest brother was getting married. So my number 16 aunt was married for a number of years no children, so they offered, gladly offered to look after me, so moved the crib, everything down to their floor. They really want the fifth floor. So they were making fun of me. They would say, oh, your mother's coming back and you have to go back upstairs. And after being down there for quite a while, I put on a tantrum. I was crying and bang, I don't want to go back <laughs> up, you know. So. All these years, uh, the number 16 aunt was like my surrogate mother. Oh, that's so nice. And it yeah. was funny. Uh, they were married for about three years, no children. They lived on the fifth floor, so number five aunt would say to people, oh, they've been married for three years, no kids. They're never going to have any kids. So after they looked after me two years, number one son came, and then followed by two and three. And the funny part is that my birthday is in October. Their anniversary is October. The first son born was October. <laughs> so it was amazing. It's so harmonic in that way. I have a question that I've always wondered about the Yip family. Because most of you were born in Canada, your majority language that you would speak in the family, would it be mainly English or would it 
also be Cantonese. Actually, we were lucky, Cantonese. Oh. What happened was that growing up, my aunts, up to number 10 uncle, all of them, my aunts were from China. Right. So right. English was very minimal. We talk a lot of Chinese. So we had to acknowledge it's always Chinese, Cantonese, like Chet Bak, Chet Mo, you know, number seven aunt, number seven uncle. And then when we talk to them, they can't speak English, so everything was Chinese. That's what I was wondering because the way that the Yip family acknowledges the relatives is very Cantonese. Like when you say eight aunt, you would say Ba Guje or say Yi. So it's just the way the genealogy of acknowledging is the way that one does it in Cantonese culture, but then it's translated to English whenever I hear you talking about it, but maybe it's because we mainly speak English. Correct. In English, it was just aunt or uncle. Right. In Chinese, my dad's number eight. So all the older ones are chat bak. Mm -hmm. And the younger one is gao so. And the aunts were uh, chat mo and some, the younger ones. So it's very distinctive. I mean, when Chinese speak, they know the relation genealogy, like who's older and who's young. Exactly, yeah. exactly. In English, it's like uncle. Everybody's an uncle or older, younger, nobody knows. Tell us a little bit more about what it was like to grow up in the Wing Sang building. What do you remember the most? I just remember the most is that I was never lonely. There was always people around. And I had cousins to play with, walk to school with, go to show. In the 40s, we would go on Columbia Street between Hastings and Pender, play roller hockey. And periodically a car would come and we'd say, car, then we'll move our homemade goals. And then they pass and then we push them out and continue playing. And what was getting ready for school like? Let me just, just give a background. The back building, Every floor has the same number of rooms, like four on each side. So we're, face, we're going east and west. So four buildings on each side, separate in the middle by two toilets, one bathroom with a tub, and then the common landing area for the stairs to go down. So we're four family, and we're the only floor, unfortunately, unfortunately, has one kitchen. Can you imagine four families, one kitchen? But it was never chaotic. I mean, we, we ate breakfast, lunch, or whatever. We were never late for school. Everybody seemed to eat at the proper time. The older cousins would get to work on time, and the uncles would get to their workplace on time. So it was amazing how they, or well, especially the sixth floor, how they organized it. Well, to me, that speaks of even though you were a big family, you were a close-knit family as well. The fact that there was communication, organization to get out of school and to go to school and to work in the morning at the right times. A lot of that is, you know, a very strong sense of community. I agree. One thing that sis really had one kitchen was that in Chinese, the older, the older one would have priority. I lived in the sixth floor of number four, six, we were eight, and trout. So four and six would cook, and they would eat in the kitchen because the table was only enough for nine people. So number eight and trout would have to set up a table in their bedroom to eat meals. And what are some of the meals you remember eating in the Wing San building? Typical Chinese. Breakfast, like toast and jam milk and cereal or whatever and then we go to school did the kids ever ask for their favorite foods for dinner or it was you eat what you got whatever anyone cooked i just ate what was served and one thing is that my number 12 aunt periodically would make like uh fish and chip some some english meal that i my mother don't make so I would just pick up my chair, go to the room, and sit down. And my number 12 uncle would say, you know, I got a black book here. I got it marked down every time you come. And at the end, I'm going to collect. And it was so funny. 
But, you know, because I was from the older brother, it was just, okay, you just pour your shirt. It was an invite. I just picked a shirt. That was it. You could smell the fish fry. You knew yes. that it was going to or be Or something chips. like sweet and sour or something like that, that we don't cook. And was it mainly back then also that the aunts or the mothers would cook? Or did some of the men never cook? No, always the aunts. Always the aunts. And did they ever have special dishes that they were known for, like the aunt with fish and chips? Most of them were traditional Chinese. See, my number 12 aunt was born here. Right. So more westernized. So she was more into the western type of meals. Maybe we could talk a little bit more about your grandfather. It would be great to hear a little bit more about him. I understand he was actually called the mayor of Chinatown. Do you know why he was given that title? Well, from what I gather, my grandfather, Yip Sang, passed away in 1927, so I never met him. But I hear stories. I mean, he set up the Chinese Bedemple Association, and before there was no hospital for Chinese, so there was a set up a Chinese uh, hospital, which is uh, now Mount St. Joel, because the number 11 uncle was a doctor. So I guess he was unofficially the mayor of Chinatown for all his uh, fellow traffic work and all that. And even though you never met him, uh, did you always hear a lot of stories about him from family members or descendants? It's funny, my, my dad never spoke to me anyhow about his father. But number six uncle did. So he lived on the same floor. And periodically when I graduated from university and working close to downtown, I would meet him for lunch, go to the Hong Kong cafe. And then he would start talking about what he did. And But I never really knew anything about him except the stories that I hear. And what about your grandmother? Oh. That was a different story. She passed away in 1957. So we moved out in 1950. I lived 15 years here. So all that time, and she lived on the sixth floor. So it was a typical grandmother spoiling grandson. I was the youngest grandson on the floor. So yeah, I had a nice relationship with her. How would, how did she spoil you? Did she spoil you with candy, with yes. toys? <laughs> She would always say, oh, why don't you come into the room? And I know there's a cabinet. And he said, when he opened the cabinet, and you have various uh, cookies, and then you pick what you want. And so I pick it. That, that sounds so wonderful. So many grandmothers are like that. My, I know my own grandmother would do the same. What kind of woman was she like beyond loving to spoil her grandchildren? When I w was living in Wing Sang building, there was two wives. One was on the third floor, and my grandmother was on the sixth. The one on the fifth floor already passed away also. But the third floor grandmother, I, I don't really remember having any interaction. She just sort of was a hermit in her room to the kitchen, her room in the kitchen. She never circulate or interact with the family. But my grandmother always goes down daily, see the daughter in law even though it's not hers, basically because of the four, four wives. But she would socialize and back and forth. In your memory, it sounds like there was a lot of running up and down the stairs, going into people's apartments, going out, sharing things. Was it really that kind of atmosphere? Back yes. Then? There was no locked doors. You would walk into people's room, kitchen, if you want especially during Christmas time, say. The ants would have goodies or baked goods and you just help yourself. So we just made our rounds. We know particular ants that have certain specialties. So we would, you know, target that room for sure. Let's talk a little bit more about Christmas and what was so special about that time uh, in the Wing Sang house. There was a Christmas tree, right? Yes. I'll give you a background. So the back building, 
as I mentioned earlier, every floor is the same. But on the sixth floor, we're the only floor that had a living room and a dining room. So the living room was on the east side facing south and the dining room was facing north. So the other floors, they were all converted to bedroom because of necessity. So we were the only f floor that had a common Christmas tree. So my older brother would sort of responsible for purchasing, decorating, and the whole family on the floor, the four family, would put Christmas presents under. So in Christmas time, we all gathered there with my grandmother and then we opened presents. On the other floors, each family had their own Christmas tree. So that's one thing that I experienced that my cousins on the other floor would not experience that day. So like community, the whole floor living together. And back then, the Christmas tree was really a real Christmas tree and bringing it up all those stairs to the sixth floor, right? Right. No, no artificial trees. And no elevator also. No elevator. And my brother would just lug it up and then when time to break it down, he'll get rid of it the same way. Do you have uh, memories of big Christmas dinners that you used to have? Okay, that's another unique fact of the sixth floor. Since we had a dining room, everybody during the entire year, they just eat in the same group and never change, whether it's Christmas, New Year. But for some reason, because we had the dining room, my mother and the f three aunts would cook a common Christmas dinner, typical turkey with stuffing and all the trimming. And then the four family and my grandmother would go eat together in the dining room. That's so nice. So you'd have the turkey and the stuffing and the traditional Western elements. Would you ever have any Chinese dishes as well with it? I, I believe Christmas was just traditional English. English. The turkey, ham, the vegetables and that. So that. What were some other big holidays? During the year, there's always celebrations. There's birthdays, weddings, and birth new babies coming in. So there was always banquets or birthday celebration. And my grandmother, when she was alive all those years, on her birthday was always a big banquet. And we would rent an entire restaurant. And just a family, the family alone would have 10, 12 tables. And with friends, it would be like 20 tables and we would have the whole place and that was big. And the other big celebration is uh, New Year's Eve. So Chinese New Year or Western New Year? Western New Year. So New Year's Eve, my older cousins would go to parties. By 11.30, for some reason, everybody say, how come 11.30, all the yips, they leave? While everybody, <laughs> everybody comes back to the building. And what happened is that the uncles and all the male members beyond the main floor and the aunts and all the female be right here in the schoolroom. So when the clock strikes 12, everybody, the ladies on the third floor and the men, they all wish everybody Happy New Year. And in the meantime, the, aunt, the uncles and aunts will be handing out the legacy, lucky money. In those days for 25 cents. So we gather at the end of the day quite a bit, you know, back in the 40s, we would think 50, 10, 15 dollars was a large sum. But anyways, after we uh, greet each other, we all march up to the third floor. And then we did the same with all the aunts and all the... Uh, so the kids would go around and wish everyone Happy New Year and collect the lice yeah. from every adult. Yeah, then we all go back to our own rooms or kitchen to eat New Year's dinner. And, and Christmas and New Year's dinner was the only time that in the sixth floor that we, the four family, get together. The other family, they maintain the same eatings up right through. Let's talk a little bit more about the schoolroom. Uh, so we understand it's a working schoolroom, and it was during the time that you lived here, but not all the Yip children went to school here, right? No, only my uncles. So grandfather knew that he, he wanted the children to 
learn Chinese, the history, the culture of, of China. So he would bring teachers in from either China or Hong Kong to teach the children. So when he passed away, then the, all the younger grandchildren went to China school. Went to Chinese school in the general area, not there, in here? No. Mm -hmm. There was a community Chinese school. There was four of them in Chinatowns. And so what did you guys do here in the school room? Well, what we, we would play, right? We would play here, and all the celebration was always here, like weddings and all that. And I heard that there was some bowling also? Yeah. <laughs> My cousin from the number nine family was quite creative. We would bow and set up pins, and he would make a track like a horseshoe, like a racetrack. And then we would have marbles, different color marbles, and we would bet and say, I want the red one or the green one. And then he would push like this, and it would go around, and whatever comes in first was the winner. <laughs> so, yeah, we just created games, and he was very creative. So, What is he doing now? Uh, he's, let's see, he's 92, and he's in a home, but he was an engineer, so maybe that's why he was so creative. <laughs> he was good at building things. Yes, and he set up what he called a tiny press. He would make monthly newsletter about Chinatown, and he would print it, and he would go to school and sell it for five cents, oh, and wow. to the family. <laughs> So did you go to the Yip Valley reunion when Bob Brady took over the building, yes. as well as the one that just happened this year when the Chinese Canadian Museum took over the building? What were your feelings, or did you feel like there was a, a kind of long interval between the first and the second reunion? And how does it relate back to your feelings about your house, the home? Well, we had a number of reunion before the Bob Brady and then the latest one in July in this year. And uh, it, it was easier before because we had the wing same building and all of us knew each other. We knew our aunts and uncles, so planning was easy. We did have email, we didn't need it. The family was basically here and a few back east. So we were part of the planning community, it was easy. So we would have people call her Auntie Grace, the number 10 daughter-in-law. She came into the family, and, and I tell you, that's how we got that family tree. She came into the family, realizing it was a large family, don't want to duplicate names for their children. So she starts sending out letters and asking families, can you please give me the names of your children? The husband was the engineer. Oh. So he thought, well, why don't we create a sort of family tree? And that's how it started. We had Chinese, but we had to have people write Chinese. And later on, when we expanded the family tree, uh, one of my nephew was an architect, and he found a program that can Chinese, so oh, that's why. Well, he came to the reunion, exactly, right? I yeah, met him. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it was fortunate because there was no way as the generation as a family tree to free. Because at the first one, we printed a family tree, and it would cost us only $5 a year. But the frame was a couple hundred bucks. So after we start upgrading, we, I said to him, I said, can we keep maintain the same? Because printing the family tree was cheap, $10. But the frame is expensive. So we managed to uh, stay until the last one where we had to expand it because we were seven, seven generation by then. This last family reunion, when you see so much of the younger generation of Yips here, and I saw them myself attend the reunion, what are your thoughts on these new generations of Yips and how they see this large family? I think a lot of them didn't grow up, so they never experienced what we did because I knew everybody. They're like strangers. I mean, I, I have never met a lot of the younger generation. They never lived in Wing Sang, so I knew of them. And now they're married and they have children. So it's wonderful that the continuity, and from what I gathered from the last reunion, a lot of the younger generation, the sixth and the, say the sixth generation, the kids are very interested in the history. Like a lot of projects I've heard like in school, they would say, okay, do a project on your family. And a lot of them did the project on the family. And typical, the people, they were just amazed. 
19 sons, four daughters, all living in the same building. That's amazing. It's just a very special Chinese-Canadian family story. It's special, but in many ways, quintessential in a way that really represents Chinese-Canadian history, story, um, just a prominent Chinese-Canadian family. So it's just great to really have this younger generation understand how special it is to belong to such a big family. And I think with the Chinese-Canadian Museum, the younger family members can come in and pick up history that they never experienced. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Mel, for joining us today and sharing all these stories with us. It really makes the building more special to us as we live and work here. Thanks for asking. My pleasure. To learn more about this incredible building, we also offer exclusive building tours every month. So to all our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in and see you all in 2024. This podcast was recorded on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. We invite you all to reflect on the territories that you're on and the host nations. To learn more about the Chinese Canadian Museum and book tickets, visit us at ChineseCanadianMuseum.ca and follow us on Instagram at CCMuseumBC for updates. The School Room is presented by the Chinese Canadian Museum, hosted by Dr. Melissa Carmen Lee, produced by Rosalie Gonawan, and advised by Sarah Ling and Catherine Clement. Production is supported by Noah Taylor and the Walrus Lab. The theme music and original audio was created by Joshua Young, and graphic design is by Studio Pian Pian He and Max Harvey. Stay tuned for next month's episode of The Schoolroom, available wherever you get your podcasts.